And we're going to go ahead and get started okay, with this sure. evening's uh, edition of Bible study. We're going to trust and believe that the Lord God Almighty has something in store for us here tonight. Uh, I'm all I'm excited about being here. I'm excited about all that God is going to do in our midst. I hope you are excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah, amen. amen. Praise God. So what we're going to do, we have an opening word of prayer. Then we're going to have a Q&A session if there are any questions mm -hmm. that I can answer from any prior, previous Bible studies or any prior Sunday service or sermons or anything. And if not, we'll move into our lesson for tonight. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, uh, we come to you right now, God, asking you, God, to be a very present help this evening as we open up our Bibles, as we open up the Word and study it, so that, God, we may become better disciples and stewards that bring you honor, praise, and glory. God, we want to be effective in our ministry. We want to be efficient as we go about uh, discharging it, and we want to be efficacious. We want our ministry to work. And, God, we know we cannot do that without you first blessing our ministries, first blessing us, and guiding us in the ways that you would have us to go. Now, Father God, we pray that, God, you would continue to do what only you could do, continue to bless us, continue to keep us, continue, God, to love on us. God, let your will uh, reign supreme. Father God, it's in your sons. Mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Brother David, do you have any questions from any previous Bible studies or any sermons or anything you've been discussing? No, that you want? I'm fine. I'm just listening to that lesson, but I would like to ask you a question. Go ahead. How does, why do people don't like to forgive even if it's in the past and something why, why, why do people not like to forgive? Yeah. Oh God, that that is a interesting question, and I think there's a there are a thousand reasons why people do not like to forgive. Um, but I think some of the the main ones, the easiest ones for us to tackle, is because I think one reason why people don't like to forgive because they think if they forgive, then they are exercising weakness. That, you know, someone has hurt them, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, sexually, spiritually, someone has hurt them. Mm -hmm. And they hurt them in such a way that they have believed that the primary reason why they got hurt was because they were weak to begin with. Excuse me. And then the fear is, is if I then turn around and forgive that person for hurting me, then I'm only showing more weakness. Okay. And I'm possibly setting myself up to be hurt by them again. We don't understand that forgiving is not forgetting, nor is forgiving giving the person permission to re-enter our lives. What forgiveness is, is releasing us from the pain that they cause us. It's by saying, okay, you no longer have control or authority over me and affect how I feel and believe because I forgive you. Whether you earnest and you're seeking forgiveness, whether you want or not, I forgive you, I release you so that I can move on and I can focus my energies on something else. Another reason why I think it's so hard for us to forgive is that many of us like our pity parties. Many of us love to have our pity parties. Ain't no party like a pity party because a pity party don't stop. And here's the thing, a pity party tends to bring us more attention than, than we normally get. Because when we're down, when we're crying, when we look like it's, when everything's not going the way we want it to go, our pity parties then uh, bring people to us and say, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. How can I help you? What can I do? And so we love our pity parties. So if we forgive someone, then by forgiving them, we have relinquished the right to be pitiful, to be crying, to be upset. We relinquish all that, and, and, and one of the side effects of relinquishing all that is relinquishing the attention that comes from feeling down, feeling hurt that people give us. And so that may be a reason why uh, we don't forgive. Another, a third reason why we may not forgive is because we may be, be vengeful. We may be so upset, so angry that we believe if we forgive them that they won't get what's coming to them. In other words, they hurt us so bad, so hell yeah, they're going to pay. And they're going to pay big. And it may not be me that gets them, but I'm praying each and every day that God, whoops, there you know what. And the problem is what we never realize and we never think of while we're being so vengeful is that we have hurt someone else that feels the same way about us. 
for everyone that, that there was a saying I heard as a youth said for every one person that you want God to take vengeance against, there's ten people that want to take vengeance against you. And as I've gotten older and I sat back on some of the ways I have behaved with other people, I can almost give you ten plus 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 ten. I can almost give you a hundred people that probably would probably be wishing vengeance upon me as I would wish it upon someone else. And so, uh, but we are so wanting to see people get their comeuppance. Oh my God, we want to see it, but we don't ever want to see it happen with us. And so, but I think that's the reason why we don't ever forgive people because we too, we, we want to see people get what they gave us. Um, Question then. Go ahead. If that's the case now, we hold in God's eyesight, of course not, the Jews went back. I thought forgiveness was one of the primary it, things. It, 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 it is. So it is. It, 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 you, you are absolutely you are, you are absolutely right. you don't right. forgive, uh, how do you expect God to forgive you? You, 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 so, are, you are absolutely right. Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times seven. In other words, he's, Peter is looking for a finite number. Jesus responds, not seven times seven, but 70 times seven. Now, 70 times seven is still a finite number. But the emphasis is be more than what you forgive. That in, in fact, Jesus then later says in another gospel is that you cannot expect God to forgive you if you don't forgive those around you. In fact, he says it like this: How can you expect God to forgive you of the uh, 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 of the slog? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it wrong. How can God, God, God expect you to forgive? How can you expect God to forgive you? with the speck of sin in your eye when you have a log in your brothers. That's right. All right? Or your sisters. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer has a line. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses, which, depending on what denomination you are, as we forgive those who debt, sin, and trespass against us. Uh, 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 repeatedly, Jesus has conditioned Christian faith on this idea of forgiveness. And he has made forgiveness as horizontal as he's made it verbal. Okay? That we cannot expect to seek God's forgiveness if we're not going to forgive our, our, our right. fellow brother. In fact, Jesus tells this parable, one of many, uh, this God that owed the king a debt. And it, the time came to pay on the debt, and God could not pay the king his debt. So the king threw the guy in jail. Um, but the guy kept begging and pleading with the king to have an audience with the king. And when he got an audience with the king, he asked the king to forgive him. So the king uh, forgave him. He released him. The first thing the guy did that the king had arrested and put in jail for a debt, he went to someone that owed him a debt. Mm -hmm. And this person that owed him a debt owed him a greater debt than he owed the king. And then when he and when he demanded payment, that second, that third person could not pay this this person. And so he had the person put in jail. Well, some of the chiefs, the king's soldiers, witnesses, and went back to the king. The king ordered the man to come back before him. He said, "What is I here that you don't put someone in jail?" The man said, "Yeah, because he couldn't pay my the debt he owed me." The king said, "Wait a second, you owe me a debt that you couldn't pay me." But I forgave you. Should not you have forgiven? He said, you know what? Take, take him, put him in jail until he's able to pay every part of the debt that he owed. Mm -hmm. All right? So there's this, this whole idea of forgiveness. Uh, in fact, there was another parable I was thinking about as I was telling you that about Jesus dealing with forgiveness. Uh, 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 oh, uh, he asked it is really the synoptic version of this. And Luke, he asked a, 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 a scribe, a Pharisee, or a lawyer, he said, there were two men that owed the king a debt. One owed him 500 denarii, whatever the money was. Another owed him 5,000 denarii. And he said, the king forgave both men the debt. He said, which one of the two men do you think had more gratitude for the king for giving the debt. And so the scribe or the Pharisee or the lawyer said, naturally it would be the one with the greater debt. And Jesus like, you're right. Because the more someone is indebted and the more and, and they're forgiven of that debt, the more gratitude they have for the one who forgives the debt. And so here, 
there Jesus is not only talking about the need for forgiveness, but the need of gratitude of being shown to the one who gave you mm -hmm. of, of the debt. And so forgiveness is so central, it's such a cornerstone, cornerstone foundation of Christianity. It's hard to really take someone seriously at their, at their word that they believe that they're a Christian if they have a problem forgiving. In fact, Jesus says, people will know that you belong to me by how you love one another. One part of loving is forgiving. That's right. Because at some point, we all of us do something that steps on someone's toe. All of us do something that offends someone. And at some point, we've got to all go to whoever we're with or who we're related to or in a relationship with and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. In fact, in fact one, of the, one of the biggest indications that someone doesn't love you is their inability or refusal to, mm -hmm. to admit, to come seek your forgiveness. Yeah. And same thing with us. One of the ways we show people that we don't really love them as we say we do is when we don't go ask for their forgiveness. So uh, that, those are good questions. Go ahead, Doc. Got no, me. no, I, I, see, I, I, see, I, see, I see it. Another one. Okay, okay. Go ahead, bro. Now, would that forgiveness keep you out of heaven if you don't? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I probably would. If you don't, you got to forgive before you leave this earth. Right? Which, so, so, so check this out. Let's say you and I were friends at one point, and you did something that really violated our friendship. And I held that grudge against you all the days of my life. I died hating you. Mm -hmm. You don't really think God's going to sit there and say, wait a second, you want me to forgive you of all your sins and that you get into heaven yeah. you couldn't forgive David of his sins? Yeah, that's a lot of sin people. That's right, Christian. This, this is why, this, even though the number 144,000 is not the literal number of people getting into heaven, right. what that number represented is that at, out of the millions and millions and millions of persons that call themselves children of God living during antiquity, okay. only a small percentage of them were going were to get in heaven. And that applies today. There are a whole lot of people that call themselves Christian. And Jesus already said that they're going to call out to me, Lord, Lord, I'm going to say, get from, from, from me. I never knew you. But you know why they, God, God never knew them? Because they never practiced Christianity the way God wanted them to practice it. They held grudge they wouldn't forgive. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they were selective in who they loved. Mm -hmm. God told, tells us to love all of our Christian brothers and sisters. Not just these over here or these over there. Not just these that meet our personal uh, qualifications or these that belong to this particular category of individual. God told us to love unconditionally and to love blanketly. Okay? So, I, I, this is Pastor, I, I could be wrong. And guess what? Let's have a friendly bet on it. If we both get to heaven and come to find out that God <laughs> let people in that did not forgive other people, you just won the bet. <laughs> no, because they won't have Because you know yourself in the Old Testament or in this it won't happen. Then if he did, what are we uh, living for? What, what are we doing? Right. We just can go out and do anything. In, 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 in other words, what that, what that does, that renders God's law void. That's right. And the word says that God's word can never return to him void. That's right. So this is why I'm saying I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm willing to argue with you about whether or not women should be allowed to be ministers and preachers. I think they should. I'm willing to argue with you because I think that's a contextual thing that Paul was dealing with. I do not think God meant for that to be scripture. Right. Okay. I, I, you know, you know, I, 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 I you know, there, there's several things in the Bible that I don't necessarily believe that they are from God. I think that are, those are human notes mm -hmm. or human insertions into God's word that, because again, I operate from this idea of what we call concentric circles, or, or not, not concentric circles, <laughs> concentric circles have the same middle, mm -hmm. but you have a great bit circle, right. and that circle is the general category, so that bit circle is love, and that within the bit circle of love are different kinds of love, erotic love, familial love, agape love, this love, that love. You cannot tell me that if God is love, and that's the bit circle, that this particular type of love sits out of that circle and is not uh, is not recognized by God and is not honored by God. I can't believe that God is love. The bit circle will allow some type of love that really speaks to who He is as love to exist outside the circle. 
Yeah, I do. You know, mm-hmm. again, I think that's a, a human insertion okay. into the word of, about an editor's prefer- right. preference. Yeah. But I do not think it's, it's worth it. There, there are things I, that I really take issue with, and I really, if I had the ability to meet with God, I was like, God, okay, turn to page 25 in this book, and then tell me, let me read this question. Tell me, did you really intend for that to be in there, or did or this someone else? Now, again, when I get to heaven and have that conversation, it won't matter because I'm in heaven. And that's that right. You know, so, yeah. And guess what? You'll never know the answer. No, it'll it'll just be for, for, for me and God to know together. All right? But, but, I, but I say that to say I cannot fathom in my mind that God would not have Christianity be, I mean, have Christianity, uh, forgiveness, be such a central part right. To uh, to uh, to what God is doing and what and how God is doing it. Amen. Praise God. I just cannot see that. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and and again, I, I could be wrong, but I do not think that those people who have an inability to forgive will will, will see heaven. And and in fact, again, I, I think there's a lot of people that are claiming they're Christians, and but God is like, you are not a Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, amen. A- 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 amen. And so, and I and I think some of the people that we don't think are Christians mm-hmm. are going to turn out to be more Christian than we are. Yes, right, right, right. We're going to be sitting on the outside the gates looking at and talking about. Wait a second, John John got in. <laughs> I didn't think John John was going to get in. John 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 didn't. He John John didn't worship like that. But John John had a pure heart, and he served oh, God yeah. to the best of his ability. That's it. He didn't judge his brothers and sisters. Hey, you you know, he didn't mistreat them. He didn't look down his nose at them. Mm-hmm. He welcomed them. Right. In fact, he exemplified the love of God at all times and all places. And so then God honored him by bringing him into heaven. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? In fact, my, my prayer is that whatever it is I need to do to get to heaven, I get in heaven. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Because yeah, guess yeah. what? Yeah. I refuse to live in this hell down here and then have to spend <laughs> the rest of eternity in <laughs> hell in down it. there. That's you know right. what I'm saying? I, yeah, we, we only go live in this hell one time. One time. All right? Yeah. And this is as close as hell to hell as I want to get. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. This, this is as close to it that I want to get. You know, I, I, after this, I want nothing but heaven. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Now, now, my prayer is that God, do you remember the show Dukes of Hazard? Sure. Remember Boss Hog? Boss Hog. Uh, a, 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 amen. And every time, every show that they, they would start off, they would always show Boss Hog sitting in his office with a platter of fried chicken eating. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And it would be heaping, all right? I just asked a guy had a platter of peanut butter cookies, <laughs> heaping like that. So I can spend eternity eating my peanut butter cookies. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Oh, I'll, I'll sing praises in between the cookies, but that's all I ask. Amen. Well, he to give you anything you want. Yeah, he get the desires of your heart. Amen. Everything. A- amen. I-, I hope you hear that, guy. Amen. Yeah. I- yeah. A- amen. Amen. Now, see, you know why? Because you got so many people that try to backstab you, do all type of things, and say all type of things. You have to, and he knows that you are doing the right thing and staying above the fray. You well, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to. Yeah, well, I'm trying to. It's, 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 it's a daily challenge. Yes, I'm saying, it yes. saying like that. It is a daily challenge well, to do that. But uh, God looks at you. He knows. Amen. Yeah, he knows my heart. You're, that's right. He so knows you my can't heart. go by the Amen. keep around or a- Amen. Put up, Amen. Say, Amen. Praise God. Praise God. There any other questions you got now? Okay, no, no, hey, man, we're going to jump in. Yeah. To our list. We're going to pick up where we left off. Last week when we left off, we had started looking mm-hmm. at the interaction between the woman and the serpent. Amen. Um, and, and that's where we're going to pick up. In fact, okay. this is the first part may be a little review, but if it is, that's fine. that's fine. Amen, because I think God's will will be done. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the serpent approaches the woman, and the first thing he says to her is, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Now notice what the 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 the, uh, uh, the, the, the serpent is doing. He is informing the woman that God Himself did not instruct her to do or not to do anything at all. This is important. In fact, people do this all the time. Let me give you an example. I sit here and I pray to God that God would give me the vision for 2020. So he gives me the vision for 2020. I write it down. I share it with my leaders. 
Yes. My leaders then go share it with their particular ministries, what the vision for 2020 mm -hmm. is, and how each particular ministry, excuse me, uh, uh, will effect, make that vid part of vision effective, have, will make it come to pass. Right. Someone doesn't agree with the vision, mm -hmm. and they say to the ministry leader, well, did God tell you that that's the vision? In other words, they're saying, okay, who told you that that was vision? It wasn't God really, it was Pastor Al. So how do you know Pastor Al really heard from God? What if this, this is Pastor Al's personal wish for us, and here it is, you're following it. That's what the serpent is doing to Eve. He's saying, wait a second, did you actually hear God say that to you? Or did someone else tell you that? And the thing is, when we look at our, our word, we find that God himself never personally instructs he says it to man, but he yes. doesn't say it to, to Eve. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and here's another thing. The second, the, ser the serpent, secondly, the serpent is informing a woman that she never heard God say to her personally not to eat from any tree. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to be instructed, be instructed, but it's another thing. You know what? You, so this is what, what the serpent is doing. Okay. Did he tell you? you couldn't eat it all? In other words, there's a line that she can't cross. And what the serpent is doing is nudging her closer and closer to that line. Because if he, he knows that if he can get her close enough to the line, she don't need to step over it. He can push her over. Ah, Check this out. If, if, if the people at home, you can't see it. We have tables here that are together. But imagine this first Intersection is the line. Right. As long as I stay back here, two and a half tables away and a podium away, I'm in no danger of falling across that line. You can push me right now. The only thing you will do is push me down yeah. over here. Oh yeah. But if I'm at the line where God says don't cross oh. and I'm teetering on it, it takes just a strong enough wind to make me yeah. fall over. Yeah. And here's the thing: the instruction was don't cross the line. God doesn't care how I cross the line. God cares that I not cross the line. And God is not willing to see here, well, you know what? The serpent pushed me so close to the line that I had no choice. No. What were you doing allowing yourself to be there in the, in the first place? Yeah. In fact, you know what this is? This is when someone does something, someone does something wrong, mm -hmm. and then you ask them for an explanation why they did something wrong. It... it the, the, the response is, well, I never thought that it will get to this point. Let me help someone out today. None of us ever think that it's going to get to this point. Oh, yeah. right. That's why it's called a fall. It is a process, and it starts so innocently. This is why we have to be so careful about who we allow to influence us. This is the example I gave to her in a New Day Bible study, okay? In fact, see if I can remember this. Help me, God. Help me, Jesus. Okay. You're at work, and you're on your team. You tend to find yourself working with this one person of the opposite sex more than you work with everyone else. And guess what you end up doing? You end up calling or referring to this team member as your work husband or wife. So you put it out in the atmosphere that you and this person share a relationship that in some way or fashion you think reminds you of a romantic relationship with, with, that you have with your husband or wife at home. So nothing is going on. This is your work husband and wife. All right? So y'all working together, and eventually y'all decide to go to lunch. Again, nothing wrong with going to lunch. Mm -hmm. But no, y'all go and create... A standing lunch appointment. Every Thursday at 2 o'clock, y'all go to lunch at Cafe de la Mort. And, 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 and that is really the love cafe. Mm -hmm. So here it is. You are creating an expectation in someone else's mind that they have the right and privilege to spend this kind of dedicated time with you at lunch. Now, you ain't committed adultery. But here you are together. 
So at the and so and so now you go into lunch lunch of a jar of flirting. At first it's fun flirting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see that the, I see that the Pittsburgh Steelers spank your Cowboys booty. <laughs> I mean just whacking, 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 you doing all this stuff. Yeah. And so it's fun and it's flirting at first. Then all of a sudden, but you don't nip the flirting. You allow the flirting to happen. And then all of a sudden, one day, the flirtation takes it to another level. You know, you really look stunning in that outfit. And nine times out of ten, we so desperate for a compliment that we don't even realize that the flirting has gone across the line. Mm -hmm. And we're working together. I, I should I should be able to come in here and trash bags and it should not bother you. Right. Because my our purpose of working together is not to meet your visual uh, acceptance or, or your visual satisfaction. My purpose of working with you is to accomplish a goal. Right. So we start... So the, First flirtation comes. The person expects you to cut it. You don't cut it. So then all of a sudden, here comes flirtation after flirtation after flirtation. At some point in the working relationship, you are not only working, at, you're not only meeting for lunch, but here comes the idea of let's meet for dinner. Mm -hmm. You know we've been working so late. You know you told me that when you go home, he and the kids are in bed already. They've eaten and they're in bed already. You have to warm up cold food. You shouldn't have to do this. Let me do you the honor of, of buying you dinner. So you go to dinner. And while you're going to dinner, you're not realizing you're developing a relationship with the person. And so then what happens, your relationship gets to the point that now it is, you know what? If you don't mind, uh, I was going to go, I'm going to go see the Rise, Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. Oh, I love science fiction movies. Oh, really? Why don't you go over here? We'll just go one day during lunch. And so while you're at the, at the movie theater, one, one or the other lays a hand on the shoulder. Instead of saying, what are you doing? Get up. We like the attention, so we let it happen. We eventually put our arms around each other. Now we're holding hands in the popcorn uh, box. And then some more, more, some morning, a couple weeks later, we're waking up in the morning and realizing, what the hell are we doing? Because <laughs> we're in the same bed in some hotel room trying to figure out how we got there. You got there because you were teetering on the line the whole time. You kept seeing, trying to see how close you could get to the line without ever crossing it. And the problem is you got so close that all it took was a gentle nudge and you would have, you fell into it. Fell into and it. now you're in trouble. Now all of a sudden, you need the Holy Ghost. Now all of a sudden, you, 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 you need God. To, no, God, uh, God said, I gave you instruction over here. Yeah. I told you don't mess around with anybody else but your spouse. But no, you so busy, you so grown, you deal with it. You deal with it. Yeah. I, 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 I see what I can see that now because it happens. It, it does. It does. It does. It and so does. the serpent is saying to her, did God actually tell you to cross the line? Nope. So that means God must mean to allow you to get as close to the line as possible. Here's another one. We know God, this is me playing the role of the serpent, we know God spoke to the man, mm -hmm. but he never spoke to you. So maybe what is meant to apply to the man does not apply to you. That's true. Remember, this, this oh, story, yeah. the serpent is a crap, he, he, the <laughs> worst that he's the most shrewdest, the most crappiest animal ever created, which means that this dude is intelligent. Yeah. This dude had to be a lawyer. Yeah. Because he is stretching the, the law and the truth to its furthest reach without ever snapping or breaking it. Oh, yeah. God spoke to the man. So clearly it's something he doesn't want the man to suffer with. But he never spoke to you. That must mean God thinks it's all right for you to do it, but not the man. It's something, it's, it's, something, it's something to think about. Yeah. Remember what we said last week? The serpent comes to the woman not because she's mentally, emotionally, or physically incapable of obeying the law. Mm -hmm. 
She is just as capable of being the law as a man is because remember, she's taken from the side of man. She, what means she's meant to stand beside him in all aspects. She has the ability to do what he does and obey the law. But he comes to her because he knows that, there, that, that the woman and God have not shared that kind of instructive relationship that the man and God did. And here's the memory I also told you. This is just speculation on Pastor Al's part, but I am convinced that the serpent is jealous of the man and woman's relationship with God. You see, man created, I mean, God created man to be in a relationship with him. But what God realizes was when he's not with man, man is alone. So man, so God created the animals to keep man company. He didn't create the animals to be in relationship with them. He created them for the sole purpose of giving man companionship. What God realized after that was even though they provided some companionship, they didn't provide complete companionship. And because they didn't provide complete companionship, God had to find someone or something that could. Hence, he made woman to be just like man so that when he's not around, man would have companionship. But the, the, the original intention is a triangle. Right. With God at the head and man and woman down here, in relation with one another as well as relationship with him. Mm -hmm. The serpent doesn't have that. <laughs> he doesn't have this relationship. I cannot help my, my my sanctified imagination cannot help but to think that the serpent is upset with this relationship with God in this relationship. And here's the thing that we have to keep in mind is that there are people and things and entities that are so upset about the relationship we have with God and the relationship they will never have with God or won't or don't think they will ever have with God that they will go to links to destroy what we have instead of developing it on and on. They will go to the furthest end of the world to separate us from God. In a hopes to make it so, make it so it's the old saying: If I can't have any, ain't no one gonna have any. And, 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 and the first, entity, the first person or entity that should come to your mind is is is, is Lucifer. He screwed up his relationship with God. Lucifer is the very first creation God ever made. But his pride, his arrogant pride. Calls him to sin against God and he forever lost that relationship. And what has he been doing since then? Trying to make sure he ain't spending an eternity in hell alone. Yeah, trying to get us down there with him. So we, 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 we've got persons all around us that for whatever reason have had have, have grown up and developed in environments where no one has shared with them how easy it is, excuse me, to enter into relationship with God. In fact, what they've seen is us in relation with God, and they and they have operated from this understanding of finiteness, that there's only so many relationships God can have, and only so much God would do in those relationships. And what they believe is they miss their number. And so what they want to do is to pull you out of the relationship so that they are not alone. Misery loves company. And misery works effectively through jealousy and envy. Yep. And yep. jealousy and envy have their have their perfect form in sabotage. Yep. And so these persons will go out their way to destroy the relationship. That's why you got to be careful about the relationships you have with people. Not everyone deserves to be on platinum tier relationship with you. Some people need to be on gold level. Some people need to be on silver. Some people need to be on bronze. And a whole lot of folks need to be on tin. A, a, a whole lot of folks need to spend uh, some quality time on tin level. Because guess what? Let a little rain come through, it'll show you how fickle they are because as soon as the rain hits them, they'll start rusting and, the, and your relationship will start deteriorating. Now remember, if we go, if we go carry this, 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 this metal analogy to a, to a T, platinum is tends to be the, 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 the top tier level. Right. And here's the thing: not everyone in reality is able to afford platinum. Right. In fact, in the music business, to get a platinum record used to mean you sold a million copies. Right. But since it was so hard for people to sell a million copies, they reduced that to five hundred thousand. 
I, I love to, to see uh, artists that still go by that old side and say, no, I'm, I'm not platinum because I sold 500000 That was a gold level. I'm platinum when I sold a million. I remember hearing Janet Jackson talk about her brother in an interview, and she, uh, and she talked about the album Dangerous. Uh, I think it's the album Dangerous. That's the one where uh, he did uh, Remember the Time, You Are Not Alone, where he used new producers besides, uh, 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 what's his name, Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones yeah. The first time he, t Teddy Riley and other producers on that, that album sold 10 million copies. And she said her brother considered that a failure. Because up to that point, all his solo albums had sold hundreds of millions. They were in the hundreds of, hundreds of millions. They sold, uh, he, I think Off the Wall got him near 100. Thriller got him over a hundred. Bad got him over a hundred. And and she made this statement to any other artist selling ten million copies of your album is a big deal. <laughs> but to her brother, who is a superstar legend, we call him the King of Pop for us. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Selling ten million albums was was a failure. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that to say. There's a reason why platinum is where it is. It ain't supposed to be accessible by everyone. Even certain levels of gold ain't supposed to be accessible. More of us wear 10 and 14 karat gold and don't even realize it. 24 karat, pure raw gold is so rare because it's so soft mm -hmm. that you really can't wear it because you're, you're damaging. You, mm -hmm. You've got to mix it with some other alloy to, to give it strength. It's that soft. You know, and then you get silver. Which really is so commonplace now that it really holds no luster or, or value as being a precious metal. It's still considered a precious metal. Then you got bronze. Even less that bronze is a combination of yeah. copper and gold. Oh, yeah. With the whole idea that the copper has in, 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 has in made the gold impure. Tin is even less than that. And really, you got lead between the, the and tin. There are levels of this. We can use real. We can use jewels. At the top is diamond. Rubies, sapphires, emeralds. And we can just go on down to the Amethyst, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Cuban Zirconia, which is just glass. Mm. There's always levels of this. And what this lesson here with, at, with the woman, the, the man, and the serpent should teach us is that be careful of the people you let in your circle because not everyone you let in your circle is operating on platform. When you go to the jury department, platinum stays with platinum. The platinum is never mixed with gold, silver, or anything else. It stays over here with platinum. The diamonds stay over here with platinum. Everything else is over there. Some folks don't deserve to be there because they're not platinum. They're tin, and they want you to be tin, too. Uh, the woman lets us know that the man did inform her of God's prohibition from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as well as the tree of life. Her response to the serpent's question was, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Now, I want us to point out a couple things here. She, the, the trick in the question worked. Remember when you told you can't eat any tree? No! <laughs> Instead of saying, serpent, I know where you're going, I know what you're trying to do, I'm stopping this, she bites. No pun intended. She bites on the on, on the on the fruit there. Mm -hmm. And she gets drawn in and says, No. It's not, so I'm, I'm saying I'm gonna start moving closer down the line. No. It's not that we can't eat any tree. We're just not allowed to eat the tree, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Notice I'm closer now to that line than I was over there. Yeah. Again, it's working. And then she messes up. The next thing she said is not the command of God. She says, God says we can't even 
We can't eat it or even touch it because if we do either one, we'll die. The instruction of God is never that you couldn't touch the tree or its fruit. The explicit instruction of God is you can't eat from it. In fact, Sean was here. I don't know if you were in the military, but Sean was here. And I know Sean has spent some time in the military. And one of the things that has Sean confirmed for us is that when uh, a commander gives them an order to give to someone else, they are required to give the order as is. They are not allowed to subtract from it. They're not allowed to add from it. Because if they subtract or add, that's not the order. And they have dissipated order. And Sean sat right there in that chair and said, that is exactly right. Because the other folks were like, well, pastor, is the same thing. Sean's like, no. If, if you add one <coughs> tiny thing to the order that did not come out of your commander's mouth and someone acts upon that, you disobeyed orders and you changed the orders. That's true. God, but God is <coughs> operating with that same kind of precision here. All right. Now, we're not certain, certain if man told the woman this when he told her. He could have added that to it. Mm -hmm. But we know that's not the instruction. God, I don't think God had a problem with them touching it because they're caretakings of a garden. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's ha ever had a garden knows that at some point, you have to prune your, 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 your garden. Whether you're talking about a vine, a tree, a hedge, a bush, whatever. You have to trim it. Typically, you, you, you prune it both in the fall and the spring. Because, because what you don't realize is there's growth that happens in the winter. It's just not the kind of growth you expect. Your, your, your plants do grow slowly during the winter. But then in the spring, you, you prune them because, one, you're pruning off any dead death that is falling on your, your plant so that new life can grow and so that it bud, all right? But in order to prune a plant, you've got to be able to touch it. My, my grandfather had an orange orchid. I never saw any of us out there pruning oranges without touching it. So evidently, God meant for them to at least touch it. The instruction was, don't eat it. Not even if you cut off a branch and the fruit looks dead, still don't eat it. God, God is a God of order. And a God of order is a God of cleanliness. So after they pruned, they had to gather up all this pruned stuff and they probably had to burn it. Just like we do in present day. Just don't eat it. You know, one of the things um, my, my mom, my aunt, and my grandmother and my uncle used to share with me that the Orange trees on my grandfather's orchid was so plentiful that the local markets would bring trucks. And these would be, they not weren't as big as they are now, but they're big trucks. And they will carry off loads of trucks to pay my, my grandfather for the loads. And so my grandfather would be out there helping prune. And what, and sometimes they would get to an orange that technically there was nothing wrong, but the, they already knew they couldn't sell it. Because maybe the orange had a disfiguration and a discoloration or disfiguration and so what they would do they would hold those back and they and my grandfather would share those with as a as a as a benefit to those who would come and helping him prune his trees or, or pick fruit off his trees so folks would go on with these big boxes of oranges that had something that was just a little off but otherwise were perfect oranges um, God didn't want that to happen here whatever fell from that tree whatever you was not Mark did not look good, did not feel good to the touch, burn it. Don't eat it. Because if you eat it, you're going to suffer the consequences. But yet, <coughs> she is, this sister has, whether she's been told wrong or she's added to it, either way, she's wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some sisters want to say, well, that's Adam's fault. That's a man's fault. He was charged with telling her. Okay, yeah. But how many times have we tried to teach people and we've taught them explicitly what the rule is, what the law is, what the commandment of God is, and someone still violates it? Oh, yeah. How many times have I gotten, I've stood before all of us on Sunday morning saying it is absolutely imperative that we exercise faith in what we, in what we're, what, in, in, in our lives. And every time we run into something, 
People come running to me. How long is about this, Pastor? How am I going to get through this, Pastor? This is going to take me out, Pastor. And the first thing I say is, did God tell you to exercise some faith and trust him? Don't be scared. How many times, I mean, again, he could have. And I won't disagree with you. That he that it could probably, God probably did put the responsibility on him mm -hmm. to instruct her. But it's clear that between the instruction at this point, something has gone wrong. And I think the problem is this. This is, again, sanctified imagination. This is not actually written um, uh, uh, in, the, in this scripture. But based on human nature as I see it every day, the very moment she was told that she couldn't eat from those two trees was the very moment she wanted what was on those trees, the fruit of those trees. Let's be for real. Think about anyone that has had children. The very moment you tell them they cannot have something, it's the very moment they want it. It could be lying there the whole time. And as long as you don't say anything about it, they don't even see it. But the minute you tell them they can't have as many things, let me tell you something. My mom had a rule. You didn't cross the line, that invisible line that separated the towel from the carpet of the living room. Right. No, no kids weren't allowed in her living room. Because that's where adults went. And she kept her living room spotless. So if anyone came, she could direct them to the living room and not the den where we were. Okay? One of the worst beatings I got in my life was my mom came home and me and my friends were sitting in the living room talking and playing with whatever we had. And after she beat me, my mother said to me, she said, I don't care um, who they are. I care that... You follow my rules. And my rules were, were such that I told you do not go into uh, the, in, into that into my living room. Do not and, and she said, I expect you to enforce my rules with your friends as if they lived here too. Right. That's right. You, 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 you got to follow what she said. All the she, 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 amen. A, 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 amen. Amen. Okay, for some reason, this is crashing. Okay. Uh, uh, amen. That's all right. Uh, I'm sorry, everyone. Hopefully, you're switching over right now to uh, uh, my uh, to the church page. Uh, I'm trying to get this up and running here. Um, but she, she was very particular about that. But here's the thing. My brother and I would always walk by my mother's living room with the question on our mind, what is so special about that living room? <laughs> Here's another one. Growing up, we ate at the small people's table. We didn't eat at the big people's table. Mm -hmm. The highlight of development in my house was being promoted to eating at the, 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 at the, at the table, at the big people's table, at the adult's table. Right. Uh, you didn't do that. So my brother and I, from the life of us, want to eat at the big table when guests come, came, and want to go in that living room. We're never allowed. Same thing. I think the woman has spent time walking by or going through this garden and passing those two trees. And every time she passed them, she has said to herself, hmm, I wonder <laughs> yeah. what is so special Curiosity. <laughs> about that, those trees. Oh, yeah. See what we're what we're not told in this story is how much time passed, and this go this is further art, further evidence of my argument that they that man and woman were created to be immortal, and that the, the cost of their disobedience is lo losing their immortality because this they she wasn't him and her weren't made one day and the next day they fell. Mm -hmm. My sanctified imagination says time has passed and it's right. been enough time that she is the, this desire to. Uh, to know what know what the deal is with this tree has uh, has occurred mm -hmm. time and has had enough time to develop has had enough time uh, to be uh, enough time to become an, an insatiable uh, uh, an insatiable thing where they want to where where uh, uh, where where she wants to find out what in the world is up uh, with uh, this uh, this tree. Amen. 
Amen. So we're going to let, I think I just need to update the app. I think it's crashing because it needs to be updated. It's on my list of apps to update. But that's all right. Again, I hope you, those persons that were watching, have moved over to our uh, church page. If not, I'll have it on YouTube a little later on tonight and tomorrow when I get home. Uh, amen. So her response is, you may, God said you may not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, uh, now, here's... Again, like we said, the woman recognized that God has not placed a total ban on eating from the trees. Second, she knew, just she doesn't know which trees she's prevented from eating its fruit. Uh, or, or she's aware of what trees they are. She, she's got a desire to eat from them. Uh, uh, let me go back for a second. Yeah, she, she, she says, here's another thing. That, that, yeah, I missed that one. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not told to eat. She doesn't know which tree that is. She doesn't say we're not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life. All she knows is we're not allowed to eat from the tree that's in the middle. So she doesn't even know what the tree is called. And so here it is, not knowing what the tree is called, not knowing what its purpose is, that probably is stoked in her desire to know even more, oh, yeah. to taste it, to eat it even more. Right. Uh, 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 what we can draw from this is that the woman knew that there was a tree or trees that she was not permitted to eat from. That's what we can draw from this. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, amen. Uh, but she is not made aware exactly which tree or set of trees they were. Uh, again, if the assumption is that God left the responsibility for making the woman aware of what she can and cannot eat in the garden up to the man, then her failure to know exactly which trees not to eat from is as much the man's fault as it is the woman's fault. You know, we are so busy and so quick to blame the woman for yeah. <laughs> eating of the tree that we fail to stop and realize that if the reason we fail to stop and realize that if the if she doesn't know which tree she's not supposed to eat from, then that onus falls on the man whose job was to teach her which tree he's not to eat from. Go back to my mama's yeah. example. Yeah. My mama had other rooms that guests would come in. She didn't care about them coming into our room. Right. They come into our rooms and must didn't she didn't care about that. She didn't care about them using her bathrooms. Right. Right. She cared about them about them coming in her living room. So, we would be in all kinds of problems if all we knew was there was a room in the house she didn't want us to go in. By not knowing which room, we, we, we would probably keep ourselves out of rooms that she meant for us to have access to. And then going in the room she meant us not to have access to. Now, if the reason why we don't know what rooms not to go into is because all she says is don't go in a room in here, then that's on mom. Mom failed. Because it was mom's job to convey the rule clearly so that we could then follow it. Right. This is why I say to leaders in whatever capacity they're in, you can't expect a follower to follow a rule that's not been clearly articulated. If you have not taken the time to clearly articulate it and to make sure that the rule is understood and, 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 and internalized, then you can't be mad at their, their, their failure to follow the rules. Exactly. Rules are only followed to the degree they're understood. That's why you have a court system that is constantly going back and uh, ascertaining what the, the, the understanding of laws are. And many times what happened, the court will, will say, well, you know, Congress or state legislature, you got that wrong. And in the very next session, the Congress or state legislature would take up that law to try to clarify it. Because what happens, the law as they wrote it was so confusing that it, people were unable to follow it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah yes, it is. Uh, 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 give you an example. <clears throat> the sentencing guidelines, the United States sentencing guidelines at one point were so confusing that persons didn't know necessarily when they were supposed to apply mandatory minimums and when they weren't. When they were supposed to give uh, 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 enhancements because of a career criminal status. 
when they were getting versus when they were supposed to get an enhancement because of an armed career career criminal status. That's the different thing. They weren't sure when they were supposed to give additional points for a, just being a felon versus a habitual felon. And that's because every state divide, defined felon differently. There were some states where, where felonies were really defined as misdemeanors, and other states where misdemeanors were defined as felonies. And so they had to go through and they had to rewrite that law so that there would be an understanding of what would be deemed a felony versus what is deemed a misdemeanor. Uh, uh, again, they had to go through and they had to redefine what's a nonviolent crime versus a violent crime. You would think that would be common sense, but you had judges who were deeming possession of marijuana and personal possession of cocaine use not enough to be possession with intent to distribute as a violent crime and sentencing persons to violent crime sentences when, when honestly they should have been sentenced to non-violent crime which are much lesser sentences. Uh, uh, a rule is only, is, you're only able to follow a rule as though, as to the degree that it's well defined. And life has proven that failure to, to the well defined rules results in people not being able to follow them. Or better yet, creating their own rule because they don't understand what your rule is asking. But again, this brings it back to the point. If she did not know what tree that she could eat from, what she could and could not eat from, that is as much the man's fault as it is the woman. And I want us to go on record today uh, uh, indicating that so that persons will know it. I guess I'm going to have to update this when I get home because it's not updated. Um, we, it is what it is. Right. And, and again, if we're going to tackle this, let's tackle this truthfully. Well, then you get this. Sorry. Uh, again, it's not enough for her to tell her that she could, which tree she couldn't eat from. He was actually required to show her the prohibited trees. This is why I say it, the, the instruction wasn't to touch, mm -hmm. not to eat. He could walk up to her. In fact, he should have walked up to her and said, you see this fruit right here? This is a fruit that I, you should not eat. Right. Don't touch, don't, 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 don't put it in your mouth. Don't, don't lick your tongue out to taste it. Do not eat this fruit. He should have actually shown her. Mm -hmm. This is the name of the fruit. This is the name of the tree. Do not eat it. Right. It's clear that he hadn't done so. Because the woman, again, the woman didn't know the name of the tree, nor did she know that the tree's fruit, what the tree's fruit looked like when the serpent led her directly to the tree. Amen. Uh, amen. Let me end on this point. This is another warning to us. If we're going to be responsible for teaching others the commandments and the, and the instructions of the Lord, we must endeavor to teach these persons everything about what God has commanded and instructed us to do. Um... Uh, Again, it's not sufficient enough for me to give you a gist of what God requires from you. My job as your pastor is to give you everything. Now, if you turn around after you've got everything and say, well, you know what, I'm going to follow these six out of these Ten Commandments, then, I, then that's on you. Um, yeah. My job is to give you all the Ten Commandments and instruct you to follow them. Right. Jesus has required us to travel to the end of the earth making disciples of everyone we meet. This means that we must teach these persons everything that he had taught us and continues to teach us. Amen. Uh, this also means that we must teach God's will from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think it was Sister Hattie that asked one time during Bible study, why do, are we even looking at the Old Testament if we are Christians? And I had to let her know, well, God, well, Jesus throughout the New Testament continues to reference things in the Old Testament. How do you know what he's saying? Especially when he's making, making a comparison or changing it to a new status. How do you know what he's, what he's talking about or what he's modifying if you don't know what's happening in the Old Testament? Especially when he says, I'm the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. Yeah. So what was the Old Testament saying? In fact, you know, when you enter onto a job, they give you an employee handbook. And on the back page is a page where you have to sign it. It says you got it and you read it. Now, I don't like that page because typically you get it on the first day. You're not given time to read it. You're, you're just told, sign this. Mm -hmm. So really the language should be, I received this on this day. I haven't read it because I haven't seen it before. 
and it's given to me in the first 15 minutes, and then they're moving on to training. You ain't you ain't actually trained. I ain't read the book. But but the thing is, the whole idea is a handbook is to get is to let you know what you have the right to do, let you know what you don't have the right to do, let you know what your responsibilities are, let you know what your op benefits are, so that you are able to function within a set of rules. Oh yeah. Anytime you join an organization, you should ask them, what is required of me, what is expected of me, what can I do, what can I not do, and what are the benefits and the drawbacks of participating with your organization. Right. Trust me, when I interviewed for this position, I made the past, everyone on the pastoral committee answer those questions. Well, you did it right, but most, a lot of pastors don't do it right. Well, that, that, I'm that, just that, saying, but well, well, that, that's on them. That is. That's, that, that's, that, that's, that's on that's them. That's on them. Mm -hmm. that, that's on them. Yeah. Be, because you should be able to make an informed decision about what you're getting into. Oh, yeah. Same thing. Persons that are giving themselves to, to God should be able to make an informed decision about that. Not because they caught, got caught up in emotions. Oh, not yeah. because they got caught up in the, in the moment. They should be able to give themselves to God because we have been teaching them about God. And after teaching about God, they, they say, we want God and not anything else. Yeah. Amen. This further means that we must put ourselves in a position where God can continually teach us about who he is and what he expects from us. Yeah. We must put ourselves in a position where God can continue to teach us about who he is and what he expects from us. Amen. We can't rest on what we already know. Because really what we already know is inadequate. We, we, God never gives us a complete picture of who he is. It's a constant, evolving, changing picture. All right? Um, uh -oh, uh -oh. Knowledge about, again, is, is progressive, is always evolving. Knowledge about God and what he expects is always progressive and evolving. It's progressive because it's always moving forward toward a new purpose, a new objective. Here's the thing. We accomplished some objectives in 2019. We should not expect God to have us retread old ground, to, to, to try to reaccomplish the goals we already accomplished. Next year is going to be new goals, new tasks, new purposes. And, it's, and he's constantly moving us forward to where he wants us to be. It's evolving because it's always revealing something new and different about God and his will for us as his disciples and stewards. Your understanding of God today should be different than it was yesterday. And different from it was last week, last month, last year, last decade. And guess what? This time that you, your understanding of God should not be the same. If you only know God as a provider and protector one year from now, you have not been paying attention to what God has been giving to you. So I feel God and, 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 myself. But many of us do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because many of us, again, don't take the time to put ourselves in a position to know God. Mm -hmm. God has revealed some other things. So he's revealed that he's a sustainer. Oh, yeah. He's revealed that he's an, an equipper, oh, yeah. an enabler, an yeah. encourager, mm -hmm. an educator, an educator. Edificate a person of edification. Yes. He's a he's a help in a time of trouble. Yeah. He's a friend when we don't have yeah. anyone to talk to. He's a will. I you hear preachers say this, but they're saying this so, so that you would get in your mind the different aspects of who he is. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Who he has revealed himself to you is not who he's revealed himself to me. It's true. Right. For 52 Sundays. Well. Let's say 48. That's far. We got we got four more left. Four more left. For 48 Sundays this year, he has revealed that he is the provider of the word. Mm -hmm. Every word I preach, I receive directly from him. Every word I preach. And every time I got worried, would that would there be more word to give? God said, Oh, I've got more word for you. Mm -hmm. If you just listen to me, I'll give you the word. So guess what? That's it. But you're not a preacher. So you wouldn't know him like that. You're not a minister. You wouldn't know him like that. And there's a way you know him that I don't know him. And that's okay. But but the point is God's revelation is evolving. It's constantly changing. His revelation about his will is constantly changing. Amen. Amen. So let me do this. Amen. Let me... Oh, so I'm at the end anyway. So we'll end right there because I need to pick up Right there. I got to do okay. some more uh, right. work. Get yeah. some more work done. It's for Bible study this week. Yeah. Amen. Do we have any prayer requests before we close out in prayer? No, no. Okay. Then here, let us close out 
in a word of prayer. Dear Father God, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you, God, for showing up and showing out here at this Bible study, providing us with the information, the understanding, and the determination we need to go out here to serve you as disciples and stewards you call us to be. Father God, we pray that you bless us, keep us, and go with us as we leave this place. We pray that you be with us over the next few days so that, you, that we may return here on Sunday morning to worship you in truth. God, we pray for those who stand in the need. We pray for those, God, who need you to heal, need you to protect, need you to provide. We pray for the, those, God, that, that need you to enable and to employ and to equip. God, we pray for those, God, who are unable to stand in the gap for themselves. We intercede on their behalf. Trusting and believing that, God, you will not forsake them nor forget about them. Father God, we pray that your will be done at all times, at all places, and all ways. God, we pray that, God, you continue to love on us and keep us and never leave us. It's in your sons. Mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn.